Go right oh. ahead. Recording in progress. Okay. So I'm going to start this up. Okay. So, oh, come now. Okay. Okay. So this is Heraldry 101, and it's really about armory because anybody who really knows a lot about Heraldry knows that within the SCA, Heraldry also encompasses other aspects of what the College of Heralds does. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on armory, and I'm going to start out with and an introduction to heraldry, just what it, what it is, why it exists, some basics about heraldry, and I'm going to spend the rest of the class period talking about fields, okay? And before I go too far, I should probably introduce myself. And within the SCA, I'm Hirschvon Henford. I'm the Gollum Herald who handles the awards list and all kinds of other stuff. And I'm also able to have my own personal title, the Golden Stag Herald. Um, and I've been doing heraldry for most of the well over 40 years I've been in the SCA um, because it just fascinated me. I was always interested in it. And so there we are. So here we go. So the course is aimed at SCA people in general, but if you are not a member of the SCA and you manage to stumble across this course, Except for some rule things that I'm going to talk about periodically, there's no reason you can't just play along. If you're a fantasy person or whatever, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, this is both aimed at heralds and non-heralds, which includes scribes, and there's some stuff in here, today's lesson and the next lesson in particular, that I think the scribes will really find interesting because they're very useful imagery. Um, so if you're thinking about registering Armory, this course may change your mind. It may change your mind about what you're thinking about registering. But even so, you know, if you have something in mind, that's great. Um, I'm going to try to present a lot of detail. So I'm going to have another more, another thing about that in a moment. If you're here just because you're interested in how heraldry works, you're going to learn a lot of stuff here. Um, one of the big things that's difficult is that over time rules change and so on. So as I as I was putting all of this together, I spent a lot of time going back to the SCA College of Arms rules to make sure I'm not giving you incorrect information based on the current rules. Um, I'm not going to go spend a lot of time on the rules themselves, but I tried to make sure that the information, the interpretations of things are as close as I can. Um, I'm going to be citing text from various books, uh, and again, so, but I don't expect you to memorize any of this, so that's important. Um, so there are some caveats. Uh, it's this, you know, basically when Sarah started publishing information about this, it talked about learn everything there is to know about reality. There is no possible way I can teach you everything there is to know about heraldry because it's just too big of a topic. I'm going to try to be fairly, um, comprehensive but I'm not going to guarantee I've covered everything. Um, there's going to be a lot of information. If you start to feel overwhelmed, keep in mind that the notes will be available online. Um, the video will be available online when Sarah has a chance to get that up there. You're not expected to memorize any of this, even if you're a herald. Um, believe me, I don't have it memorized. I am constantly looking things up. Um, You'll come away with a lot of information about herald, how heraldry works. There are going to be differences between real world and SCA heraldry and where they are there. I'm going to be focusing on SCA interpretations because I'm assuming most of the people who are here, if not everybody, are in, within the SCA. So, yeah, basic stuff and everybody's already turned off their, their microphones. Um, if you do have a question that you feel is really important about the topic at hand and you put something in chat mode, um, let's, uh, Sarah should be able to let me know about it. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm going to ask you to hold your questions until the end. Um, but on the other hand, questions are important. Um, I'm, I've been a teacher for many, many years over my life lifespan, and um, I feel very strongly that the stupid questions are the ones you don't ask. So uh, please, if you have a question, write it down, and I will do my best to answer it at the end of the class. So I, I'm going to be talking about information a lot. I'm going to be talking about a wide range of sources. Um, 
I'm trying not to spend a lot of time on the College of Arms rules because that's a whole other area. And unless you're a herald, you don't need to spend a lot of time in the College of Arms rules. Uh, they can be very confusing. So um, there will be a resources use page at the end. Um, you could call it a bibliography. It really is. I just didn't want to use the term bibliography because that kind of puts some people off. They start to feel like this is a college class or something like that. Um, when it, there's a, a term in here called SENA, S-E-N-A. When I talk about SENA, that's the SCA's College of Arms rules, and it's the standards for evaluation of names and armory. And again, you don't need to memorize that. But, uh, so, okay, so the goals. So now we're gonna get to the actual first lesson. The goals for this lesson are to define the purpose of heraldry both in period and within the SCA to explain the difference between a device or arms and a badge and why you may want to use them. Um, to give some basic information about heraldic language. And we're gonna be using heraldic language and as we go, hopefully some of it will just stick because there are certain terms that I'm gonna probably use without even thinking about it. I've been doing this a very long time. So hopefully some of this will just stick. And again, um, it's all explained. I, every term that I use, I try to explain within all of this. There will be some basic rules that you have to know, um, but I'll try to keep that to a minimum. And we're gonna spend most of the class session talking about fields. And we'll talk about that again in more detail, what I mean by that. So heraldry, why does it exist? So basically this all sums up to in the very early middle ages, fighters started wearing closed faced helms. Before that, you could see who somebody was by just seeing their face. But as soon as people started putting on helms where they block the face, how do you know your opponent? Well, you decorate the shield, you decorate clothing, you decorate banners and so on, which over time became heraldry and over time became codified. And by codified, I mean rules determining what you can use, how you use it, where you place things, color on color, which we'll come back to, um, and so on, started becoming codified. And so you have all the rules that you see in all those books that are on people's bookshelves. So the most important thing is you have to be able to identify it from across a war or tournament field. So this comes up with the most important rule of heraldry, which is the rule of tincture. And again, I'm gonna come back to the actual rule and explain it in some depth in a, in a little bit here. Um, in the SCA, pretty much the same thing. If you look at a photograph of two fighters and you know their heraldry, you know who the fighters are, which is exactly the point. Um, of course, when you're not on the tournament, whether you're a fighter, whether you're somebody else, having a, having a banner at your camp shows that you're at the, at the event. Um, wearing a piece of clothing that has some of your armory on it shows everybody who you are um, and all of that good stuff. So. Heraldry serves a very strong purpose. I use it all the time with my other role of being a kingdom historian where I look at photos. And if I see somebody in the tournament field and I know who their, their armory, I can go right there and go, okay, I know who that person is. I can tag them in a photograph, all of that good stuff. So we started actually, um, one, of, uh, one of the attendees of the class before a class started asked this question. It was really about devices and badges although that's not how he put it, that's still what we're talking about. So the question comes up all the time. So what is the difference between a device and a badge? So a device is also what comes, becomes your coat of arms. It's used to represent you, okay? When you get an award scroll, your coat of arms tends to be on it, um, which is your armory. Um, we call it a device because you may register and a, 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 your, your armory before you have an award of arms or a higher level award within the SCA, which grants you the right to arms. It's a, it's a minor technicality, but it allows us to state, okay, this is a device. And when you do get your, your award of arms, then they become your coat of arms. Um, it allows you to, to do this without having to worry about it. Some people get really worried that you can't register your coat of arms or you can't register your device unless you have an award. That's not true, so there you go. So the other side of it is a badge. Badges tend to be used for a variety of reasons. So your device is used to represent you, and one of the first things that I try to tell people with, with all of this is if you consider your device or your coat of arms 
to be your social security number within the SCA, it's really kind of that because your device is unique. We have rules that allow people to register things and avoid um, com uh, competing with each other so that they're not the same device. So you can't have two people with the exact same coat of arms. Okay. So this becomes a way of, of, of register of noting who you are. So badges can be used to mark your belongings. They can be used to represent your affiliations for a household or whatever. Um, local branches can use them for registering awards. Um, so an award will have a specific symbol used for that award. They can have a populist badge. The West Kingdom has a populist badge. All three of the principalities have populist badges. And they allow people to display that badge um, on a banner, on a t-shirt, you know, whatever, to show loyalty to that principality or the kingdom and so on. And badges are also used for officers so that you can see a banner with the cross trumpets on it and know that that's where the College of Heralds is. Um, same thing for the marshals and so on. Um, and so having badges allows you to have ways to identify people in a wide range of ways. So now the other thing that's going to be really important is heraldic language. The heraldic language is called blazon. Blazon is a combination of a variety of languages from medieval French, English, um, some continent, continental terms, and modern English. It can get a little weird trying to read it at times, but once you start to become familiar with it, it's very useful. The purpose of the blazon is so that somebody who is not familiar with how you draw your device, your badge, whatever, but understands the rules of heraldry and understands blazon can draw that piece of armory. Um, this is very useful for scribes, for example, because they don't have to see a picture if they know what they're, if they know what things, how things work. They don't have to see a picture of what your arms look like to draw something that is technically correct. And note, I state technically correct. I've had people complain that an artist used a different charge or, or different interpretation of a charge or drew something differently than how they draw it. Well, that can be a little frustrating, but literally it is technically correct if it is recognizably that charge or it's recognizably that field or it's recognizably whatever. So, but blazonry allows somebody to read through that and interpret it and turn it into the actual piece of imagery. So, turning this around, the image itself is called the emblazon. So, we use the term blazon to describe the emblazon. Okay, so the blazon is a description and the emblazon is the picture. A very important aspect when you're registering something is the College of Arms registers the emblazon, it registers the picture. And that's very important because a lot of people think that they have to write out the blazon on all the forms and all that stuff. If you don't, it's okay. The heralds will take care of it. So now blazon can be very specific and there are, there are points where you can have a really complex blazon because they're trying to be really specific, but there are also places where it's not specific at all. These might be something like in my example on the screen says an eagle. Um, an eagle by default, is quote displayed and we'll talk about that when we get to that lesson but by default it's displayed if it's in a different position then you would have to stay an eagle whatever position it happens to be um, and the same thing for the tinctures you might have an eagle that is proper in which case a bald eagle proper would have a white head brown feathers and so on um, and you don't have to actually write out white head brown feathers it's part of the term proper um, and we'll talk about proper again when we get to that point. Um, but it allows you in a blazon to go simply an eagle or an eagle proper, and you would know it was an eagle displayed. And if it was proper, then you would know that it was using proper tinctures and so on. Um, there are almost always exceptions to the rules. I note this because as I've been working with the heralds for many, 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 many years, um, you just think you understand the rules and then some exception comes along that says, in this case, that rule doesn't always take effect. Or in this case, the rule gets bent a little bit, you know, that kind of thing. So 
There are some rules that are pretty hard and fast, but overall, most of the rules do have a few exceptions or at least one exception and so on. Okay, so the basic rule you have to know, this is the rule of tincture, um, and it's literally, and I, I'm using the wording out of an article by A.O. and Amber Drake, who was a, a very active herald and scribe in Kaid many years ago. Um, it says, thou shalt not place metal upon metal or color upon color. And what that means is, um, within the SCA, we use five colors, black, blue, red, green, and purple. These are called the colors. And there are two metals, silver or white, and gold or yellow. The reason for this rule is that you need to have contrast. Placing a blue item on top of a purple background makes the blue item hard to see, even if you're looking at it close. And if you're looking at it from across a tournament field, everything blends together, okay? And so the rule of contrast says you can't put a blue item on a purple background. You would have to use either silver or white or gold or yellow, okay? That would be the two metals, okay? So... That, that rule is one of the most important, and there are, but even so, there are places where that particular rule does have some exceptions. And we'll talk about a few cases over time, but um, the, the one thing I do want to point out is we do occasionally find somebody who wants to put a black charge on a red field, but you have to prove it. You have to prove that it was done in period, and you have to have it not just the a black charge on a red field, but it has to be a black whatever your charge happens to be. So we had somebody a while back who had to give three examples of a black wolf on a red field from period armor. Okay, so it has to, and that's called an individual attested pattern, and that's a complex thing. But most of the time, you probably don't have to worry about it as long as you try to keep the, the rule of tincture in mind. There are cases where you can get away with things but the rule is pretty good otherwise. So basic heraldry. So you have to understand a few things. Heraldry is defined by layers. So you have a background of the armory. This is the field, and that's what we're going to spend most of this class period on. Um, a field is literally the background. It's a color. It's a combination of colors. It's a and, and so on. And we'll look at how you can modify fields. Um, badges may be fieldless. That's a very specific thing, and we'll talk about that again later on. Um, devices cannot be, be fieldless, and most badges also have a field, okay? You can then place charges on top of the field. It's possible to sometimes register field only. Field only is really rare, and that's usually something where you have a field that's divided by two colors or three colors, and they're very in a, unusual combinations. Um, otherwise, they're going to conflict with something. So, so the rest of this is going to be talking about layer, about fields, and this is going to be the bottom layer of your device or your arms or your badge or whatever. The last lesson that we took, the last lesson, which is the sixth one, we'll talk more about putting everything together. So, okay, let me just, okay, basic. I'm just making sure I have notes for a lot of the stuff that aren't on the screen. So, okay, so. Now, we're going to be using a device for most of our examples because the device is usually shown on a heater um, or a shield shape um, is what you will see in almost every heraldry book, and it's what we tend to think of for heraldry. Um, so I'm giving you a simple example. The top of the shield is the chief. The bottom is the base. The left of the shield is dexter. The right is sinister. And then I try to explain, sinister means left, doesn't it? Well, if you're the person holding the shield, sinister would be on your left. If you know anything about theater, consider this to be stage direction. Stage left is the audience's right. Sinister is the left if you're carrying the shield, but if you're looking at the shield, sinister is on the right. Okay? Now, blazon tends to work, and I always try to give some disclaimers in some of this stuff, tends to work top to bottom and left to right. So when you're defining what's on a shield, you start at the top and the left, and then you work your way through depending on how the shield is laid out. 
If you look at various books, you'll see that some books talk about the shield being nine points or whatever, sometimes more, sometimes less, and they use things like nominal point, and they, those terms start to get really confusing really fast. Um, within the SCA, we will sometimes use Dexter Chief if you are placing a charge in the upper left of a field, um, that kind of term rather than trying to come remember all the different points and try to deal with all the different points. We want as much clarity as we can in our blazing. So if you have to put special terms in, it gets a little crazy at times. Now, are you limited to a shield or a heater to display your device? No, you are not. Um, if you have a shield and your shield is round, you can display your device on a round shield. If you use a kite, use a kite shape for your shield. If you're putting it on a banner and the banner is rectangular, you use the rectangle for your shield. There is nothing that says that you have to use the heater shape. Following along with that, going back to the very early days of the SCA, there was an understanding from some of the early textbooks that we had available, mostly Fox Davies, but a few of the others, that basically said women's devices were registered on lozenges, which are diamond shapes. Well, diamond shapes mean that you're kind of limited to what you can put on the device, because if you want something that looks good, is balanced, we'll talk about that as well at some point, um, and all of that good stuff, um, the lozenge can be a little tricky. There are some people who really very carefully design their arms to work on a lozenge, but at a certain point, there became a rebellion where the lady said, no, we want to be able to use the heater shape like everybody else. And so the lozenge was no longer required or, or expected of women to use for their arms. And there was much rejoicing. So there you go. Now, tinctures. We're going to talk about the tinctures. Blazon uses the medieval French for the tinctures, which can be fun. So the colors are sable, azure, vert, pure pure, and ghouls or black, blue, green, purple, red. Um, when we talked about them within heraldry, if you read a blazon, you're gonna see sable, you're not gonna see black, okay? Um, the metals, gold or yellow. Now, the reason I say gold or yellow, if, some, if a scribe is doing a coat of arms on somebody's award scroll, they might want to use um, gold on the actual device, gold paint or actual you know, a gold leaf on the device um, to represent the color gold. Um, but it's easier to just use yellow. And the same thing for silver or white, it's called argent. Um, and when you look at various books on heraldry, if you actually do, you will find that uh, there are some tinctures that aren't shown here. This is the SCA. We cut this off at 1400 approximately. I don't remember the exact date, but around 1400. Um, so we don't use tinctures like 10A, which is orange, and there's a whole bunch of others that we don't use within the SCA. Um, so now, when you're looking at blazon, um, the tinctures themselves tend to show up in all lowercase when you're looking at the words except for the word or, and that's to avoid any confusion with the word itself or and the tincture or. By using a capital O, we always make sure that there's no question there. Um, if a word is used at the beginning of a blazon, so you have a black field, you would start with sable and it would start with a capital S. But other than that, if sable is used otherwise in the blazon, it would start with a lowercase s. So all the way through. Now, in the images above, note that the colors are saturated. This is meant to state they're a good, serious blue. This is not sky blue. This is not lime green, okay? This isn't lavender for, for, for pure. They're meant to be a good, solid color and no debate over what the color could possibly be. Um, so there's an article by AON which is aimed at heraldry for scribes, which is where I started working on all of this. Um, and she actually gives suggested paint colors for each of the different tinctures. So just something that might be useful if you happen to be a scribe. So, okay. Yeah, when we look at fields, a field can be one of those colors or it can be a combination of those colors. And we'll come back to how we do that. 
Um, you can also use what are called furs on a field. So furs are a form of a tincture that are sometimes neutral, sometimes not. Now the term neutral means if I have a black charge, I can place it on top of something if, it's, if the field is neutral. Or if I have a gold charge, I can place it on the same field and it, because it's a neutral field. Now neutral is tricky with furs because some of them are neutral, some of them aren't, okay? So if a fur is predominantly one color, which we'll take a look at the examples here, um, they can't be neutral. And when we get to the ermine furs, which is what we're going to start off with, ermine furs cannot be neutral. It's just not possible. So now ermine furs are a fur that have ermine tails, or sometimes they're called ermine spots. The image that I'm showing you here is taken out of one of the various books that I have, and I can't remember which one. But um, these are all individual ermine spots or ermine tails, and they all look very different from each other, okay? Um, that's because different artists and so on. Um, what you see where you see spots on these at the very top of them, and they, again, the spots look different as well. These are meant to represent a pin used to hold the ermine tail to the fur or sewing used to attach a tail. So spots where the sewing was done, okay? Now, on the right, this is one of the most commonly used ermine tail or ermine spots. It's simple, everybody recognizes it. Some of the others, somebody might wonder what you're looking, what you're doing, okay? Especially the one that looks almost like it's a bird. Um, some people kind of would really look at that and go, is that, what is that supposed to be? So, now, um, one thing to note is if you are using ermine on a device, you should only use one form of ermine spot throughout the device. Um, there are people who thought it would be kind of cute to use multiple ermine spots on a device, and it's really not what was done in period. Um, if you have multiple displays, however, and you like different ermine spots, on your shield, you might want to use one ermine spot. On another, on, on a banner, you might want to use a different ermine spot and that kind of thing. So you've got some options for that. Now, here are some examples of ermine. Now, I had a friend of mine uh, redraw some of these because the original art imagery that I was using from Eowyn's articles were really kind of art, really hard to um, fill in the colors and so on in some cases. So Rav very kindly did this artwork for me. So ermine, this is the default ermine. It's white fur with black ermine tails. Okay, and that is the absolute standard for ermine. Okay. Now, counter ermine goes the other way. You simply reverse the colors, black field or sable with argent ermine spots. Then we can go to ermine wa, which is gold, and it has black ermine spots. So the only real difference is you're changing the background. But if you look at each of these, you will see these aren't really neutral. They're not 50% one color and 50% the other color. So that's where neutral comes in. So in this case, you could not place on uh, counter ermine a red charge, okay? So now peon, or P some people just use peen, but it's actually peon, language is fun, um, is just again the reverse of ermine wa. You have a black field with gold ermine spots, but you're not limited to these four for the ermine fur. You can decide to do something different. So you can go with Ghoul's Ermine Argent, which would give you the one on the right. So you could go with Azure, you could go change the color of the spots, you could have gold spots instead of white spots. You can really kind of mix it up. Um, so that makes things kind of fun because you're not limited to that. One thing I do want to point out with Ermine that you should be aware of, and some heralds will, re will, wear will warn you of this, if you don't like drawing lots of little detail on things, you might want to avoid ermine spots because you're going to get real tired of stenciling them or painting them or, you know, whatever you do for your decoration. So just something to keep in mind. Um, I know William the Lucky once complained about some sleeves that he had where he put ermine spots on them and he painted them. He said he got really tired of painting ermine spots after a while. So, Okay, now other furs, the, one, the other real obvious fur, well, not real obvious unless you've seen it, but it's called Ver. Ver is from the pattern created by taking the fur of a British squirrel, which tends to be blue-gray, 
and the belly of the same squirrel and sewing them together and creating a pattern, okay? So, and because I can't help it, you know, there are <laughs> variations of there. Um, so basically this outline here, this shape right here is what is called a bear bell, okay? And so you will, you can actually use a bear bell as a separate charge, which is kind of unusual and very weird, but there you go. Um, but basically it's blue and white for the purpose of heraldry, okay? This is a neutral field. You could put a black charge on that. You could put a gold charge on that. You couldn't put a white charge on that because it's gonna blend into the white parts of the background. But you could put a gold charge on that. So this is what we call a neutral field because it's 50-50. It's, it's, it's part color, part metal. Counterwear goes, goes in a different pattern here, okay? Ver on point, another interesting pattern. And finally, bear in pale. So you've got the standard bear, and then you've got these interesting variations, again, as, as, as kind of a you know, silly little joke. Um, one thing that I find interesting is that Parker, one of the standard resources for um, heraldry and where a lot of the SCA's um, rules are based, um, actually notes that um, he doesn't believe the variations come from, that he, oh, he believes that the variations come from just accidents in drawing. So one scribe or somebody drew counter bear rather than what we call bear, okay? But within the College of Arms of the SCA, they are considered at least a little bit different, so. Yeah, and again, you can do something, you know, very Argent and Ghoul, so if you wanted red instead of blue, you can go with the different variations, counter very, all of that. So by using very instead of bear, um, it allows you to define the colors, okay? Now, there's another one called Potent. Now, Potent uses the same colors as Ver, and again, Parker actually thinks that this is a case of, draw, of bad drawing of Ver. Um, however, various other sources talk about these being based on the shape of a crutch. So, Potent is also the term for a crutch in medieval French, apparently. Um, and so again, you have alternating shapes and it's blue and white. And again, this is a neutral field, okay? And you have counterpotent and you have potent on point. So you again have options for how you can draw that. And it can give you some interesting capabilities for doing, interest, doing things with your device. So now you can also define your own colors. So you can have potent, argent and ghouls or whatever, so. Now, these other two items are categorized with fur. They're not really fur, but they kind of fall under the same general idea. So we have papillony, which is scales, um, which uh, according to Fryer is derived from butterfly wings. I don't quite see that, but okay. I'm not gonna argue with Fryer, okay. Um, plumity is overlapping feathers, okay. And that one's fairly obviously overlapping feathers if you look at it. One of the important things with plumity is you really want to add some detail into that. So those little black lines that are in there are kind of important to the actual um, plumity. Otherwise, it gets these just these odd shapes and they're really hard to work with. So, okay. Now the field itself, um, coming back to this. So the field can be solid, meaning a single tincture or a fur. It can be divided into parts. It may have a field treatment or some, and we'll talk about each of those. Um, and we'll talk about what I mean by some. I, I hit on the, the some thing in multiple places about it being a, a series of identical charges. Um, so, but anyway, uh, yeah, field divisions, which is what we're going to look at next, is a way to take that field, and rather than just going with a stable field, um, you can divide the field, and you probably, if you've looked at any heraldry, you've seen chart devices where the fields are divided into parts, okay? When you talk about the field divisions, if you look at any book, most of them talk about party per and a division name. The word party is almost always left out, especially in the SCA, but even in a lot of the, the standard reference materials, um, the word party just gets dropped, so... Um, now, let's see here. Um, we're going to look at divided or partitioned. So sometimes some books talk about partitioned fields. This is what we're talking about. Um, 
for most armory, the field is the first layer, and in the last lesson, we'll take a look at layers a little bit. But it's the first layer, it's the background. Charges are placed on top of it, and charges are most of the other lessons. So um, we'll get back to those. Now, field divisions, I'm going to break this down into groups. So we have the field division per FES. It's a horizontal line, and you have two tinctures, one on either side of that line. Um, they don't have to be metal and color. You can have two colors on either side of the line. You can have two, two metals on either side of the line. So you're not limited on that, okay? Now, per pale is a vertical line through the center. And then combining that, you get quarterly. Now, quarterly is interesting because you basically have two colors and you can also do more with that, but it gets a little difficult. I actually asked on Facebook this morning because I was curious because I couldn't remember. If you are designing something where you have a field where, and if you look at the last item, it says it has numbers. You have quarter one and quarter four are argent, and quarter two is ghouls, but quarter three is azure, blue. Um, you can do that, but the blazing gets a little more complicated because you then have to specify the colors very carefully. Okay, they would go one, two, three, four, okay, in that order. So, and that's why I was asking online this morning was I couldn't remember. Okay. Now, field divisions, again, per bend. Per bend is a line going from the dexter chief to the sinister base. And you're dividing, again, the shield in half. Okay. Per bend sinister is going the other direction. Per saltier is combining them. Okay. So, once again, now, per saltier, again, you could probably do something similar. Remember that we go top to bottom and left to right. So one would be the top, two would be the left, th three would be the right, and four would be the bottom if you were dealing with the numbers, okay? Per chevron isn't really 50% of the field. Okay, it's really hard to make that into 50% of the field. I don't even want to try to guess what the actual percentage is, but... Um, but the idea is with a per chevron is you do something along these lines. The point goes above the horizontal center and the bottoms go somewhere up the side, okay? One trick, and I'm not gonna spend much time on the actual paperwork, but on the forms, there are tick marks around the outside edge of the shield for, the, for, for registering something. And there are tick marks that some people think are what are used for a chevron. They're actually used for per bend and per bend sinister. Um, the chevron actually goes a little bit below those where those tick marks would be. So now there's per chevron inverted and I and unfortunately Eowyn's article didn't have that. So I went out online and found something that I could use. Uh, this is from a website called Heraldry Illustrated. And all of those, all of the websites I reference in here are listed in the bibliography or the resources. Um, now, um, I do want to point out the SCA uses the term inverted, but some of the books use the word reversed. I think inverted actually makes a little more sense, but it's basically taking per chevron and turning it upside down. Notice that with per chevron inverted, that you're not coming from the upper corners of the shield. You're coming from part way down the side, okay? Um, per chevron enhanced. Now, this one's tricky. I pulled this from a website, um, the Traceable Arts, uh, Art, Traceable Heraldic Art, or whatever he calls it. I don't remember the exact words. Um, but that, that site has some issues, and the artist there calls this per chevron. But compare the third image to the first one. The first one is correct for per chevron. This one is what would be called per chevron enhanced. And what that means is the point is higher. And in order to make the point higher, the sides go down a little further, okay? This allows you room to put charges on either side of the field division, okay? So there's a chat question, okay? Let's see here. Um, the color, okay, do you, do you, do you, the question about um, the, the color is not being subject to the rules. You're not placing, when you're dividing the field, you're not placing a color on a color. You're placing it next to it. Does that make sense? I hope. <laughs> okay. So, so that does allow you a lot of flexibility there. Um, let's see. There's one more. Come on. Nope. Come on. 
Okay, Chevronelli. Uh, this actually belongs under what is varied fields, but I wanted to throw it in here. You can divide the field into multiple chevrons, which is kind of an interesting way to deal with your field. Okay. So three divisions that are shown on this slide are, don't really show up in the British heraldry text. They are um, continental, but they are used in the SCA quite a bit. Okay, let me double check this. Okay. Good. Okay, so basically the response back was they, they thought that the rule was they couldn't touch each other. The colors can't touch each other. They can actually, as long as they're not on top of each other, that's the big thing. Okay, so these are continental and they're very different looking. Oops, I need to come back, click on this to bring it back. Okay, um, the first one is called Chape. And I, I mentioned Bruce. I'll talk about Bruce on and off throughout all of these. Bruce Draconarius is a Caedon Herald who has been a heraldic scholar for many, many, many years and is very good. Um, and I grabbed some, uh, some of the images that I used throughout these lessons are from his website uh, because they show what I needed to show. Um, Chape is, is, is French for mantled, meaning a mantle placed over something. If you have a mantle over your shoulders, it would give you a shape kind of sort of like the first charge here. Um, this is actually a field division. It's not a charge, okay? And so that again allows you a lot of flexibility. This looks a little bit like per chevron enhanced. However, per chevron enhanced does not touch the top of the shield, okay? So the chape part is the two corners. Um, typically the mantles are not charged and in period heraldry they just weren't. Um, I don't know if it was a hard and fast rule, but there aren't any examples that most of us can find. Um, if the lines bend inward, they are called chape ployé. So the term ployé references the curve of the line. Okay. You have chasse, and I'm using Aowens because it was perfectly good for that. But then I had to use Bruce for chape uh, chasse ployé. Um, this kind of goes the other direction, where um, the mantling or the or the chape is on the top for a chape. Chasse goes the other way, and it goes down the sides. Okay. And again, this looks a bit like per chevron inverted, except again, per chevron inverted would not go to the bottom of the field. Okay. So if the lines are curved, you have chasse ployé. So you've got both of those. And the last one is really kind of interesting. It's called V2, which is vested. Um, it's two lines from the center chief um, out to the side and then down to the base. And so you get basically a lozenge in the center of your device. You can charge. The center, the actual V2 is the, is the parts around the outside edges. Um, these are not charged. You do not place charges on the outside of, of, of V2. And the same for V2 ploy A. You can put something in the middle of V2 ploy A or V2, but not on the outsides of it. Kind of an interesting bit of, 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 of just, very, just going completely outside of some of the standard stuff. But this is continental heraldry, and not everybody followed the same rules. So. Okay, coming back to pretty standard heraldry, gyrony. Gyrony is splitting the field into eight, eight pieces of pie, just like a piece of pizza. Well, sort of like a piece of pizza. Um, it's basically combining quarterly and per saltier. Um, if you use gyrony and you do not give a number, it will default to gyrony of eight. It is possible to have a gyrony of six. And if you rotate this, you can rotate it so that the horizontal line goes vertical, which would then be a gyrony of six pale wise or a gyrony of six per pale. And that's because of the pale line, the vertical line, okay? But by default, if you say gyrony of six, you'll get the image that's on the screen. It is also possible to do other divisions of gyrony. Um, one example I'll show you later on uses gyrony of three. And there are several devices registered in the SCA with gyrony of 10, gyrony of 12, gyrony of 16. I wouldn't try to go beyond 16 personally because that's just, you know, what's the point at a certain point? Um, okay. Now, you then have per Paul, which is divided in thirds. These are defined by chief, sinister, and then dexter. So top, right, and left, which is kind of counter counterintuitive based on the way we talked about a lot of this. But you're basically going clockwise in this case. So you start at the top, you go to the right, you go to the other side. Oops, let me just. Uh... 
Um, it's possible that we've got, so the question is um, going for something really simple, gyranium 6 or unsable. It's very possible that somebody may have done that. Um, if they did, it might actually be something in period. So in which case there might be a conflict from there. So, but yeah, basically a, a, you're talking about a, a, a device that has no charge. So it's called a field only charge, a field only device. So yeah. Okay, so going on to, just coming back here and next. Per Paul inverted is just basically turning it upside down. Okay, so you've got, you know, you're just turning the whole thing upside down. The colors would then be defined dexter, sinister, and base. Okay, so per Paul inverted, argent, ghouls, and azure. Okay, and then there's what is called Tiersten Paul. I figured if I was going to do the dividing it into three parts, I'd use all three of these in one slide. Um, divided in thirds with vertical lines. And now somebody who really knows their heraldry could actually call this per pale um, argent and azure, a pale ghouls. We'll talk about pales in the next lesson. Um, but this could also be simply Tiersten Paul. So different ways of looking at it. Okay, now it is possible to combine some of the field divisions. This can get really weird um, and you can get some very interesting divisions. Okay, these two examples I'm going to show you were the first two that I found, and these are the two that are referenced in most books. Um, the first one is per pale and per bend, and if you look at it, per pale is the vertical line, and per bend is the um, diagonal line. And what this does is it gives you a field divided into four parts in a kind of unusual combination. Um, the next one is per pale and per chevron. And it's doing the same thing. It's dividing the field into four parts. If you look at all the lines, it may not look at first like there's four, only four parts, but it's actually only four parts. This allows you to alternate the colors, and it's kind of an interesting combination. Okay, so the last thing about just the field, without going into the more complex stuff, um, are what are called varied fields, where you're taking the lines of division that I've shown you and you're doing multiples in a lot of cases, okay? So Barry is a field divided equally with multiple fest lines, okay? So Barry or Barry is multiple bars, and it's typically six of them, okay, typically. And you could have Barry of eight, okay? Um, so you can actually define the actual number if you want to, but by default, if you simply say Barry, it would be six. Paley goes the other direction, it's vertical. And Checky is combining them, and you get a Checky field. Okay, so that's kind of fun. Now, Bendy goes diagonal, and again, it's typically six. Bendy sinister, and combining them, you get lozenge. Lozenges are diamond shapes. Okay. And so lozenge is what we would have here. This is not, and I, I add this note, this is not a summe of lozenges. We'll talk about summe in a little bit, okay? So now, because I am not a good artist, and because I didn't want to make Rav try to draw all of this when I was working with him, um, I pulled this out of Fryer, and he gives you a lot of different possibilities for these varied fields, okay? So let me just get to my notes here. Okay, go to here. Okay, so um, so if you'll note, he gives you the numbers up here and he tells you what they're called. So you'll see that in here there's gyrony of 12, which is item 12, interestingly enough. Um, you'll see piley, which is using multiple piles. Um, you've got a couple that I've shown you. You've got checky. These are kind of fun. These are actually uh, more used on on charges. This would be um, a bend company, which is basically a series of checks down the bend. And then there's the next one next to it is counter company, um, which is basically two lines. And you can use that. And again, we'll talk about ordinaries in the next lesson, but you can use these on ordinaries. You can also use them on other charges. And it's kind of a cool little effect. Um, so, uh, okay. Now, the next thing, and this is where we get into dividing the field and using fancier ways to divide the field and using what are called lines of partition. Um, these allow you to get fancy. You can do some fascinating things with these. Um, the direction of the points is important, although it gets a little interesting if you read a lot of the books. They talk about the honorable position. 
And that's a weird one, and I'll come back to that. But um, basically what you're dealing with is with these points, the direction of the points can be very important. And we'll take a look at some of these in a moment. Um, one thing that's really important for SCA heraldry is that you cannot use a complex line on a field that is sable and pure pure or sable and azure. Those two end up being dark enough and close enough to each other already. And if you add a complex line, they will just blur, the, blur things and it will be very difficult to even see the complex line. So that's that. Okay. Now, a complex line of division um, should not have a charge overlying the field because, again, you can have issues. We actually had to return something to somebody a while back in the West because they had a complex line of division. They put a cricket on top of it, and we couldn't make out the cricket for the complex line. It was just too much, and so we had to return it. They ended up moving it so it was off the line. It was above the line, and it solved the problem. But anyway. Um, now, so these are the standard lines of partition. Erdi are a series of bear bells, okay? Invected um, is small semicircles. When we talk about the honorable position, the puffy part of invected is pointed up, okay? And so the SCA heralds sometimes use the term infected to reference invected because it just shows the puffy part, right? Um, engrailed are small semicircles and the points for those semicircles are pointed up. That's the honorable quote unquote position, okay? Indented looks like this. And we, you, we do sometimes use a term called density, but the article that I pulled these from didn't have an example of density, um, but I will show you one in a bit. But density is very much like indented, which is these pointy shapes, saw shapes, um, but density is deeper and there's less teeth, okay, less less of the, of the sharp pointy parts. So, and again, I'll show you an example in a bit. That's kind of hard to describe. Raggedy is based off of a ragged staff, which is an old pilgrim staff concept. Those are meant to actually represent branches coming off of a staff that were cut off. Um, they're slanted. Um, and the, the uh, teeth must point upwards, but all, but but in a but in a fess. Okay, so I, it's a little d difficult to know for sure which direction that goes, and we'll talk about that again when we look at some of the examples. Okay, embattled is based on the crenellations of a castle wall. Dovetailed, which shows up in the lower left, is based on woodwork, so dovetailed for woodwork. Potenty is based off of the fur potent or the crutch shapes. Nebulae is supposed to be based off of clouds. Okay. Um, wavy is supposed to be based off of water. And rainy is adding rays as in the rays of a sun to a line. Now that one's a really complex one. And again, if you're thinking about making a banner or something, think about trying to sew all those lines. Uh, just something to consider when you're dealing with that. Okay. Now it's cool looking, so if you want it, there's nothing to say you can't. So again, I pulled some stuff out of Fryer here. This particular example does give you some things that may not be acceptable to SCA heraldry because it's what was on this on, in the book, and I just didn't feel like trying to edit everything out. So, um, but what you see here are examples of some of it. And notice at the top on the left, you will see indented, and right below it, you'll see density. And he shows indented on a chief, okay, we'll talk about chiefs later on. Um, and then he shows density on a per bend line. Okay, so a per bend density. Okay, so you can use these lines in various ways. Okay, you can use them to modify the line of partition. Um, and so I'm gonna give, you'll see various examples as we go, um, sometimes on other things. I do wanna point out, that on this example, crested, embattled, grady, and saxonized may not be SCA legal. So it's a very important thing. If you see something, um, don't always assume that it's legal for SCA use. Um, some of them may be and some of them may not be. Okay. So, and it shows you some of the ordinaries with these. And again, that's the next lesson. One thing I do want to point out, this one threw me, the last West Kingdom Heralds meeting, this one threw me, and I went on a weird research gopher hole. Um, 
Arandi. So basically this means rounded off. And what you can do with this are some interesting ones. These are pulled out of uh, SCA registrations because none of the books that I have show this. Um, so we have Gyrony Arundi. And what that means is you have a Gyrony field, but you curved the lines. And they all go the same direction, but you curved the lines for the Gyrony. Okay. Um, there's Gyrony of three, and this is the one that really threw me. Uh, there actually wasn't this particular device, but it was one very much like this particular device. It's Gyrony of three, which I didn't know you could do at the time when I was doing my research. Um, and it's also a Rundi, and it's three different tinctures. Okay. Azure, Argent, Scaly, Pure Pure, and Sable. Okay. So that's showing you actually using Scaly in something as well. Okay. And again, because that's a field division, you can get away with the black touching the blue. Okay. There's also Per Paul Arundi and Per Paul Inverted Arundi. You can also use Arundi on quarterly on every on, on, on a lot of the other divisions. Um, things like bend a bend you probably couldn't use it on because how would you do that? Uh, but anyway, um, these are basically what are called field only armory. The one on the left actually has a charge and that's the border. We'll talk about borders in the next lesson. Um, so, but the other ones have no charges on it. These are field only, only heraldry. Okay. The square shape is a badge. That's, you know, just not something that you need to worry about right now, but that's what we use for registering badges. Okay. Now, other ways you can modify the field. There are two items that are related to each other, but they're not the same. Um, the first one is called a field treatment, okay, which is a decoration of the field in some manner, okay. And the other one is called a same. We're going to spend a little time on samees because they're really cool, but they do have some very specific things about them, okay. So many sources also reference the term diapering. Diapering is a decorative motif drawn on the field. And if you fight in the West, you may have seen a few shields that have been painted with um, a blue field and some detailing on the blue field. That's not actually a registrable piece of decoration. It is just a way of, of fancying up the shield, okay? Making it look a little fancier, drawing attention to things. And it's really kind of cool looking, but it's not something that is blazoned. It's not part of the actual armory. Um, and if you're filling out forms, I would not put diapering on a, an, on a registration form for the College of Arms. Uh, they will probably send it back to you. Okay. So now field treatments. Um, when we look at this, and again, I pull it, I had Rav do, help me with this because the original scans were from an old, old, old scanner and these lines were very hard to color. Um, you have, and these are just a few of the possible ways you can do field treatments, but you have Freddy, which is bendlets and bendlets sinister, and they are interlaced. Okay, so they're basically giving you a, a woven pattern here. You have grillage, which is turning it the other direction, bars and pallets. Um, you have melee, which is annulets, which are circles. Um, they are linked to form the appearance of chainmail, so melee. Um, you have mason, which is meant to look like brickwork. Very important aspect of mason is you have to define the tincture of the bricks and the lines, okay, the mortar. Um, sable, mason, argent is this particular example. Um, uh, you have to actually define what the mason part is because otherwise no, it could be anything, okay. Now, if you find other treatments, you're flipping through a book and it shows you something, you should check with a herald. Make sure that it's actually legal. Um, Aowen's article actually shows honeycombed, and I mentioned in the notes as well for this particular slide, but um, this was not defined in period. This was an SCA invention in the very early days. It's no longer legal because it was not used in period, okay? So anybody who has honeycombed for their field can keep it, but it's no longer acceptable. Okay, now semis, semi or semi, um, can also be called a wide number of other terms. And if you go digging through various heraldry books, Friar notes aspersed, powder, powdered, replenished, strewed, or strewn. Uh, within the SCA, we call it semi or semi. 
we just keep it simple. We don't try to use all these different terms because otherwise people are going to be looking, having to look things up all the time. Okay. Parker defines this as the field is strewn with charges uh, w without any reference to numbers. So some is just a bunch of things thrown in on the field. Okay. The trick is these are charges on the field. So you can't have blue, something that is blue on a red field for a SME field because this is actually putting charges on top of the field. Okay. Yeah, some forms of SME have their own terms, and I've got several examples I'm going to show you. Um, every book that I've looked at talks about SME as being charges placed on top of the field, so that's important, and the SCA does the same thing. Um, okay. Now, when we look at these, you get semi delete or semi delete, which is really kind of cool. Okay. One thing to note is that Rav did this as a kind of wallpaper, and this is one form of doing it. Okay. Um, notice what, I, what it does when it gets to the edge of the field. It just cuts off some of those fleur de lis. Um, you can do it that way, or you could choose when you're putting, the, putting your arms together to leave off the floor to leave that would be cut off. Okay, you would just have a blank spot where that floor to leave would be. Um, there's just different ways of looking at it. Um, another aspect of this is that some people see a SME as being random. So literally, and Wintersgate does this, um, because when we were creating Wintersgate, that's how we understood SME. Um, and that's literally just kind of randomly thrown across the field. There's no pattern to it. Okay, so. Now, annulity, Rav didn't do the wallpaper thing, um, but uh, molity is a bunch of stars. Uh, and these are five-pointed stars by definition. A mullet is five points unless you define the number of points. You could do molity of six points. You would have to define six points. Um, estoily or estoils. Um, we'll talk about estoils again later on, but these are meant to represent stars. This is what originally with heraldry, and a stoil was, was what was used to represent a star in the heavens. Um, okay, billity are a series of rectangles, billets. Gooty is a summe of drops. Um, there are different tinctures for different um, goots, and we're not going to get into that here. We'll get into that later on in another lesson. Um, but you could have gooty azure or gooty d'alarms, which is what this one is. And that Goody de Larms is basically stating Goots of Water. Okay, you can have Goody de Zong, which is Goots of Blood, which would be red, and so on. Okay. Um, Same of Crescents in the upper right. Um, and Cruzily, which is quite literally defined, and it's defined in every book as a Same of Crosses Crosslet. These are very specific crosses. Okay, they can't just be any cross. You'd have to actually define them as a Same of Crosses, whatever definition of that cross happens to be. Okay. Um, most of the most charges that you can use in armory can be used as a SME. They would be called simply a SME of whatever charges and then you would define the tincture. Okay. In those cases you would define the field color first, a SME of charges, and then the tincture. So that would be the way the blazon would be laid out. Okay. So I don't know how I did on time. That feels like that went really fast, but um, actually, no, that's not too bad. Um, so, have any questions that weren't asked before? Um, you're still muted, Sarah. Okay. I mean, that's good. Uh, I said people can probably unmute and turn their camera on if they have yeah. questions. Sure. Oh, I have one question about field decoration and division, actually, if I yeah. may. Sure. So let me pull up the design that someone sketched up really quick. So um, don't worry about the charges because the charges on this don't matter. Okay. Or they were just placeholders anyway. But what... This bendwise sinister sash thing with two chart divisions and then the same color in the middle. 
Okay, is that so, SCA legal? Um, yeah, actually, um, what you would have is a Ben Sinister um, fimbriated. And we'll talk about fimbriation in a later lesson. <laughs> but basically, fimbriation allows you to take a simple charge that is of a color and um, put it on another on a colored field or the other way around, a metal and a metal field. But you would have to have something that gave you the contrast. So in this case, they're using a metal for the um, fimbriation, which is the line outside. Now, this fimbriation is actually probably a little thick. Okay, fimbriation tends to be a little finer line, but you can you can get away with that. Okay, and that's, Thank and you. that's a way to have a, a blue bend or on on the field like that. Um, although usually it's done for you know a different teacher field, but you know whatever works. You know, there's lots of ways to it, there's lots of ways to do almost anything. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so it gives you Thank a lot. Thank you. Of, I was just curious. Of, Thank you. Yeah. So I was right. looking at that in chat. So okay. Anything else? I was just curious about what you would call that. So thank yeah. you. I'm excited yeah. for the next lesson. Yeah. Thanks, and, we'll, and we'll come back to uh, fimbriation, I think, in the last lesson. But yeah. <laughs> so it'll be a little, little ways down the road still. But yeah. So all good. No questions. I'm not seeing any. Either I answered everything as I went or uh, everybody's good. OK. So. If there's no questions, I'm going to go to. Oh, there's a something in chat. Okay. Oh, thanks. Okay, you bet. Okay, so next, so we've pretty much covered fields. Okay. So is there more? Of course. There's always more. I've covered a lot of what you can do with fields. I can't possibly cover every single thing, or we'd be here all night. Okay, and then probably into the morning. And yeah, um, there's there's a lot that you can do. Heraldry is fascinating. It's complicated. Sometimes, sometimes it's really simple. We prefer simple, but you can get pretty complicated. Um, so um, the next lessons, we'll discuss charges. So actually, out of these six lessons, four of them are going to be on charges. Okay. The next lesson is going to specifically focus on what are called ordinaries and subordinaries. And the ordinaries are going to be very similar to the field divisions, most of them. So that'll, that'll, you'll, you'll see the relationship between those as we go. Um, so that's what's coming up next. I see several chat items. Let's see, oh, lots of thank yous, okay. Okay, well, you're all welcome. Um, okay, so real quick, this is my, my, my bibliography. It's gonna be slightly different from one lesson to the next, but you'll notice that there's an awful lot of links in there, but there's also the tech, there's also books and there's ISBNs if there are ISBNs. Um, I've got a lot of different books. There are people that have more. There are people that have a lot fewer. That's just the way things go, right? Um, but I also mentioned AON's article. Um, it's actually a really good article um, in general, but I felt like as I started working with it that I, there was so much more than what is in that article. And so I wanted to expand on that, which is how we got to all of this. Um, Fox Davies is one of the first books that the College of Heralds ever used because if you walk down um, University Avenue, every bookstore probably had at least two or three copies of, of Fox Davies sitting on a table and the Heralds scarfed them all up and then they would show up again and we go, I just saw six copies of Fox Davies you know, and so on. So yeah, the Heralds scarfed those up. Um, Fryer is actually kind of fun because he does a good job of defining a lot of stuff that some books don't. Fox Davies sometimes gets a little weird about his definitions. I don't see a difference between this and that. Really? <laughs> okay. Um, and let's see, uh, the website. So I do want to point out these two websites here. The Book of Traceable Heraldic Art, I mentioned earlier when we were looking at the Per Chevron. This one can be useful, but you have to use it carefully because unfortunately the guy did some interesting things. I pointed out that I, I used his Per Chevron for what is actually Per Chevron Enhanced. Um, it's a good drawing, but it's not really what per chevron looks like, you know, that kind of thing. So you have to be careful. And there are other things that he that he did wrong as well. So take it, take it with a grain of salt. If you're not sure, ask somebody. Um, the other one is actually not bad, but he's not real thorough. You know, I mean, I grabbed a few things from him. Um, I didn't put the link for Bruce's website up here, but it'll be on several of the other lessons. Um, but Bruce, Bruce Drakenarius has a really good uh, website for 
armory images. I also give you links to the, uh, to, to the rules if you really want to look at the rules. Um, um, I mentioned Child because I really like that particular book. It was the first heraldry book I found in college, um, and it is what I use for my, I use the imagery from that for various things. So, um, and we'll see some images in later um, lessons as well. So, well, there you go. I hope you feel like this was worth the time. I'm surprised it just kind of went zipping by as we went, um, which is kind of nice. Um, I hope it didn't go too fast. Um, don't expect to be quizzed on any of this. Um, this is something that you just, as you use it, it becomes more and more set in your head. Um, so all the stuff with blazon, all of that stuff, so after a while you start to recognize something's not in the right place in a blazon, uh, just because after a while you use it all the time and you get used to looking at it. Um, so. And like I said, the, the notes will be available online um, and the, this PowerPoint presentation, which has all my notes as well as what's on the slides themselves um, and all the images will be available online in PDF and in PowerPoint. Um, so if you want to download those, you can do that. Um, and that's about it. The next lesson is planned for two weeks, I think, mm -hmm. unless something comes up. So the, the goal is two weeks from now. And again, that will be on ordinaries and um, subordinaries. So there we go. Thank you, everybody. I'm, looks, it looks like everybody seemed to think this was worthwhile. So off to a good start. Okay. Okay. Wanna, are, are we done recording? Yep, I can stop it right now.